Now, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, that the teacher of the church tonight is not a man or woman, not a white man or black man or brown man or Asian man or anything such as that, Lord. The teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit, according to your word, and we give you the praise and the glory and welcome you, Holy Spirit, to touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and help us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. There's a life you desire that we should live for our own benefit. Lord, you're already benefited. You're already blessed. You're already prosperous. You're already successful. This is about us. This is about how we are to conduct ourselves so that we can bring in your presence that brings in your blessings, Lord. So therefore, Holy Spirit, have free reign in our hearts tonight, in our souls. Teach us, share with us, enlighten us in these profound words of Jesus, and we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. And Lord, we're a church that's not selfish, that we only think of ourselves or see ourselves as better than everybody else. That's not true. We're a church that cares about other churches. They may do things different than us. They may worship different than us. They may, you know, have their whatever traditions and rituals. But Lord, we're a church that cares about them. If they preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and exalt Jesus, they're our brothers and sisters and we want you to bless them as you would bless us. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Because Father, you love us all. Enough to be in with all of us. And we give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Great big shout, we all say what? Amen. Amen. Um, I've been sharing this with Deborah recently, and we've just been having fun with this, so I thought I'd share it with you. Is that okay? Now, the only difference between sharing with Deborah and sharing with you is coffee in the morning. And she's a whole lot prettier. And uh, I have a hard time keeping my eyes off of her. You know, Grandpa is turned on by Grandma. That's the way it's supposed to be, by the way. It's not a habit. It's not something that you just do. I'm more in love today, and I know she is too, because she tells me. And she thinks I'm handsomer today than ever before. And that's what happens when your eyes go dim. (laughs) But it's for a reason. So you can see your spouse in such beautiful ways. Matthew, the 15th chapter, please. The words of Jesus are so amazing and you just see them jump off the page. I don't know, maybe for a lot of you they they don't, but I'm gonna help you to see them tonight. Just jump off the page and speak to you personally about some things that are really important about your life. Is that okay? And um, because that's what this is all designed about. This is not just a history lesson. Can you imagine getting to heaven? And God says, well, we want the best and the strongest historian that knows all the history of Jesus and all the stories of the Bible, and then you get the biggest reward. It doesn't work that way. God's not looking for a history lesson people, people of historical backgrounds. God is looking for somebody who will catch a hold of the anointing of the word of God. Everything that's in here is not just a story about Jesus, it's a story about you. Listen to what I just said again. Everything in here is not just a story about Jesus or his disciples or what he's doing so that we can learn history. It's a story about you. It's a story about your life. It's been been retained in scripture, maintained for thousands of years, listen to this, at the cost of thousands of people's lives. So tonight you could sit where you're sitting and hear the profound words of Jesus that'll change your future and your destiny and bring the presence of God into every area of your life. Is that okay? And so I want you to concentrate with me. It starts off, first verse, 15th chapter. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, I'm gonna stop you right there. Just for those of you that don't know this, the scribes and Pharisees that were in Jerusalem were the religious leaders of that day. That's what they were called. They were like, the guys with ecclesiastical robes, you know. And they're from Jerusalem, which means they're from a 
very important portion of that leadership, a group of scribes and Pharisees. And they're coming to Jesus for a specific reason. And it's important that you understand that the very first words they speak out of their mouth is gonna give them the reason and their heart behind why they're saying what they're saying. Which if you have any wisdom at all, when you read that, you realize that these, this is pinned in scripture and preserved for you so you could see something about what they did which literally was wrong and Jesus picked up on it immediately. Sometimes in your life, there's people that are gonna do certain things to you and if you don't hear what they say, you will never understand where they're at. And God gives us this great insight to be able to read the inside of a man by listening to the words that come out of his mouth. Jesus is, is absolutely no different here and he's not just telling a story, he's talking about you, learning something. Listen to what Jesus does. This first chapter, I mean this 15th chapter, first verse, makes a statement that they're coming and they're saying something immediately. They didn't come and say, gee, how are you, Jesus? We heard great things. You're wonderful, you're kind. We heard about all the people getting healed. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And, and you know, we, we know that in time we're gonna learn more about you, Jesus, but you know, we're here to just, uh, relate with you. We're here to be friends and encourage you. And we're here to let you know that um, we back you and we wanna hear what you have to say because some things you have to say are very strange and different to us, but we're open about this. They don't say that at all. The first thing out of their mouth is an accusation. He, they accuse him and his men of something. It's a, not only accusation, it's a belittlement. They belittle him immediately, right out of their mouth. And they accuse him and they try to, listen to this, put him down so they can make themselves feel big. Are you on, on the page with me? Yes. They're trying to put him down so in the eyes of the foolish people that think they're so wonderful because of their religious ecclesiastical robes, they, they look big. Jesus immediately picks up on who they are by the words, these little words that he, they say, verse two. And it says this, and why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. <laughs> I mean, right off the bat is not high or nice evaluation. Oftentimes in your businesses, oftentimes in your life, some of the first words that come out of people's mouths establish where the people are coming from. I remember recently in the debates we had in America, between the Republican candidates, there were 17 of them. There was an unusual one that was joining 16, 17 others that were on the platform. Whether you like Donald Trump or don't like Donald Trump is not the issue. I could care less about that, to be honest with you. I wanna say something that in the very first debate and the very first question that someone asked Donald Trump, her name was Megyn Kelly, and I happen to like Megyn Kelly a lot. She asked a question that was rude, in his face, and, and, and controversial, and put him in a spot, and she actually played where she was at with him at that point. He picked up on it, and you remember how it says, and you hit him, he'll hit you back? And that's exactly what you see with Jesus here. They actually come in and hit Jesus, trying to knock him off his feet with this word, this expression, this question that was out of place. I mean, truly, she could have started with any other question except the rude question that she started with. The very first question, the first time she's ever answered a question as a candidate. And, and that shows to anybody, especially you now, all your life you're gonna be confronted with people that are gonna start sentences and talk to you and you need to hear what comes out of their mouth in order to hear what's really in their heart. And what came out of her heart 
was, her mouth was really in her heart and it really was a put down. Now, again, I don't care what your political insight is. That's not what we're here about, nor are we talking about that or caring about that. I'm just simply making a point. And here are these scribes, the first thing they do, first thing they do is they come to Jesus and out of their mouth, they display what's inside of their heart. We want to belittle you. We want to cut you down. We want to make ourselves feel big. You know, we're the ones that are the scribes. We're the ones that are the Pharisees. We're the ones in the robes. We're the ones people look up to. We're the leaders of the people. And now you have this little band of people that you think you are. Who do you think you are is what they were really saying to Jesus. And Jesus is, can I just tell you something? That is stupidity going to seed. In other words, it's gone as far as it can possibly go that how stupid can you be that the Son of God, creator of the heavens and the earth, holds it all together by the power of his might. When the word, world was ever formed, he formed it by the word of God, according to John. And all of a sudden, here he is with God in front of him, and they open their mouth against him. We have a tendency to open our mouth, put our feet in. And we, if we're wise enough, we'll open our mouths, take our time, think about what we say before we expose what the depths is of our heart that may cause problems down the road. Is anybody listening? I haven't even gotten into the verse yet. Verse three. And Jesus answered and said to them, Well, gee, I'm real sorry my boys are stupid enough to eat bread without washing their hands. That was really dumb of them. Man, I'll have to talk to them about that because, you know, we wouldn't want them to defile themselves. Does your Bible say that? No, it doesn't say that at all. Jesus comes back and says these words in verse 3. Read it for yourself. Look at it. Now, come on, think. For he answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandments of God? Because of your traditions. For God commanded you, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. Let me tell you something. That was the retirement program in those days. They didn't have social security. (laughs) God's smart enough to make sure the kids take care of the parents. And that was called honor. Do my children hear me? (laughs) That's called honor. I'm only kidding. God has already honored us. And so that's called honor. And that was how the older were taken care of us. The kids would, would provide for them. And Jesus comes along and says, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. And they says, this you have, you have, you have failed to do. Talk about my, my guys washing their hands when they eat bread. Here's a bigger deal that you're doing. And these guys are sitting back. How does he know we're doing that? Watch this, I'll show you. In verse number uh, five, and he says, whoever says to his father, whatever profit that you might receive from me is a gift to God. And you might say to yourself, what in the heck does that mean? Listen to this, verse number six. Then he need not honor his father or his mother. Thus you have the commandment of God of no effect. You have, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Now Jesus just really nails him. So for those of you that don't understand what just said, let me explain to you what Jesus knew. In those days, the children were to do two things. One, they were bringing their tithes and offerings into a priest. It's just the way it was, part of the law. It's what they did. Second thing they were gonna do, that was with whatever they had left over, they were gonna take care of their parents. Some of the kids, like kids today, don't wanna even think about such things as taking care of their parents. And so they wanted to get rid of their parents and don't wanna have to pay that extra money. So what they did is they would find a corrupt priest or scribe, Pharisee, and instead of giving them the money just for tithe and offering, and then giving the money to their parents, they would give the money to the, as a gift to some of the money, not all of it, as a gift paying off the scribes and the Pharisees. And that became the tradition that substituted the word of God. And Jesus calls them on the carpet and says, you know, you don't wanna give it to your parents. 
You don't want to be killed because that's what it says that you should be put to death. And so, and you don't want to pay your parents, so you give a little bit to some uh, thief uh, called a priest or a scribe or Pharisee, and he condones you for doing that, and that now has become your tradition, and now you tell your parents what money I give to the priest is a gift to you, so you don't have to give it to your parents. Now do you understand what Jesus is saying? Now, you know, sometimes we have this image of <clears throat> Jesus being so kind and sweet. I don't know, I've been to churches where they just meet Jesus up, but I know Jesus to be in your face, man. You don't mess with God and anybody that does, you're gonna have big problems. The traditions of men is what he's talking about that has really subverted the commandment of God. We oftentimes in our own days make our own traditions up that keep us from the real relationship with God. In fact, there are some churches that you go to, God bless them, I'm not their judge, but I don't wanna put belittle anybody, but I do wanna bring it as a point to you that if you don't go through some ceremonial rituals, you certainly aren't gonna make it to heaven. Can I tell you something? That's a bunch of baloney. It's never been based on the ceremonial rituals. It's always been based on the attitude of the heart. And in fact, I remember one of the traditions was when I first started, there were two very important traditions that the American church had. Number one, you had to have a great education. And I didn't have that. I was just a guy who picked up my Bible, started reading, and God started talking to me. And that was unacceptable. But it was a tradition that you go through all the schools and learn what men have to say. And God wouldn't let me do that. He said, I want to teach you. And obviously he has over the years. I don't have to make excuse about that. The second tradition is, when you went to church, you always wore a suit and tie. And if you didn't have a suit and tie on, you couldn't possibly be a man of God. And I had every kind of suit and tie you can think of. Deborah will tell you, I had a dozen of them or more than that, and I'd have to mark them. I wore it on Wednesday, so I didn't wear it again on Sunday. And I'd have all my hangers marked so that I never wore the same suit and tie. I had so many suits and ties. And I was really into that. And then I realized something that is important. That's a bunch of junk. It has nothing to do with what's on the outside of a man. It has to do with what's on the inside of a man. So when I started this church, do you remember this, Fred? What was I wearing the first time you ever saw me? Hawaiian print shirt. A Hawaiian print shirt and shorts, right? That's how I preached the gospel. That was how many years ago? 26, 27 years ago, I had shorts and a Hawaiian printer, never heard of it. I was making a statement. The statement is, it's not about what I'm putting on around my neck. It's about what's in my heart. And the tradition of a man can't stop the move of God. And sometimes we set our own traditions up and we say a man can only do this. If he doesn't do that, he'll never make it to heaven. Can I tell you something? You can do all the traditions and all the ceremonies. You can go to every uh, seminary school, do all the traditions. Can I tell you the truth? You can be the leader of the church or the senior pastor or the head pastor or the lead pastor of that church that you finally after seminary school die and go to hell because it's not about traditions, it's about the heart. And here Jesus makes a statement. He says, man, your traditions have caught you up and you're blaming me about bread that my guys are eating without washing their hand, which doesn't defile them anyway, does it? Well, you know, if you want to eat bread with dirty hands, that's your problem. You're just going to eat a lot of bugs. But it's not going to change and keep you from heaven. Do you understand? And they made a tradition out of it. Now listen to this. Some of the things that were mentioned in the law were not spiritual things that get you closer to God, but kept you healthy. And there was a difference between doing something in the law that kept you healthy because of, of all the sickness and disease and inflammations and all the lack of medicine and stuff in those days, all that keep you healthy. But if you made that which God spoke part of the practice in order to get closer to God, it's not closer to God, it just keeps you healthier in your life. Does anybody listen? And there are people right now that are caught up in traditions thinking that's getting them closer to God. It may keep them healthier, but it didn't get them closer to God because it's not about what goes in your mouth. It's about what comes out of your heart. Is anybody listening? 
which is so cool because listen to what it says in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 18, 19. <clears throat> and we need to know some things. And here's one of the things that we need to know about traditions. Watch this. Watch what Peter writes. Knowing that we were not redeemed with corruptible things. You know, you did not get redeemed by something that was made by human hands. Bread, you know, clothes, certain styles, certain looks. You know, you're not, re redemption didn't come by the physical things, what he just said, like silver or gold. From the aim, redemption didn't come from the aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers. What did it call them? Aimless conduct. Aimless conduct that were received. Now there are some traditions that are godly traditions, listen to me now, that you need to uphold and keep in your life. There's no doubt about it. God has some things that are godly things that bring you closer to him that if you do them. That's a tradition that you need to adhere to. But here he comes along, he says, aimless conduct received by, not from God, but traditions from your fathers. <clears throat> Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of the lamb without blemish, without spot. That's how you and I got saved. Same thing, it wasn't to traditions, wasn't going there and bowing before I did something or wearing certain kind of clothes or, you know, doing certain, it was, it was all about the, the heart. And that's what he starts to say to these guys. And he, he makes this statement. He goes on to say to these guys in their face. I mean, they asked one question that was an abusive, abrasive question. They're getting a whole lot of verses back. That is just something that you need to know not to mess with God. Verse number seven, hypocrites. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, geez, come on. I, I've been in meetings sometimes with some guys, I tell you, they say one thing and do something else. I just want to yell, hypocrite. Uh, you know, but God says, no, just shut up and let me deal with them. You know, but hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does something else. Can I just say something? You know, all of you know, all of my children preach the gospel. In fact, we just text uh, Miranda and Henny that have the Rock Church in Temecula, big church, massive. And they were just on their way to church. We were asking about on the way here about getting together for Christmas and so on. And uh, Debbie made a statement. And the statement was, isn't it great that all our kids are preaching the gospel? And I tried to talk them out of it, every single one of them, including Miranda and Henny. I tried to talk about it. I said, this pastoring is the craziest job you'll ever have. You meet up with the craziest people. It's just like insane. There's some going to insult you. There's some that are going to love you. It's like, what in the world? There's got to be, there's, there's no logic to it other than the fact that God is supporting you and he opens doors, closes doors. Go find a job, a real job. I've told them all that many times and none of them have. You ever wonder why they all did what they did? Here's why. Because the word hypocrite, when it comes out in a minister's family, the first ones that pick it up are the children. And I may have been a jerk, but I was a jerk in the pulpit as well as a jerk at home. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And when I did things that were wrong, Luke, you know, Pastor Luke preached last week an amazing message. He's like, I told you this a million times, four years old, come up to me, said, Dad, you know, pastors don't talk that way. I said, how do you know pastors don't talk that way? You're four years old. <laughs> Shut up, Luke. I mean, he always put that guilt on me, you know what I mean? Dad, pastors don't talk that way. So, okay, I'm sorry, I, you're right, you know. And in between him and mama, I didn't know which one had the Holy Spirit the most. It was like, <laughs> uh, I was always under condemnation of some kind, because, uh, but I was real. And, and what you saw in the pulpit is what you got at home. And my kids saw that and they said, wow, you know, dad's real. I did, he didn't have to phony this up like he's real spiritual in the pulpit area. And then at home, he's just, you know, a, a, a jerk. 
Uh, so if I was a jerk in the pulpit, I was a jerk at home, you know? If I was spiritual in the pulpit, I was a spiritual person at home, but probably more spiritual than a jerk because they decided to follow God and serve the Lord. So the word hypocrite turns people really off. Now Jesus is gonna quote from Isaiah to these guys and he says these words that are brilliant. Let's listen to them because they're really words that you and I could fall into as a trap. Hypocrite, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, you saying, you saying. You could take that you and put me in there. Because this is a very true statement for any one of us. Now watch this, for any one of us. Listen to this. And he says these words. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Oh my goodness. You know, we can give God lip service all the time. You know, we can come and give God, uh, honor him with our, our, our mouth all the time. We can come in and sing songs to God and lift up his name and all that stuff and walk out of here and be an absolute dog. And that's called a hypocrite. And the one thing you can't do is you can't do that and get away with it with God. You might get away with it with men, but you will never get away with it with God because he doesn't, listen to this, he knows your lifestyle follows your heart. And a lot of times we don't realize that everything is about the heart. For 22 years I've been teaching in Bible college a subject called Cardiology 101. Looking at the heart of David and how God developed it. And for 22 years that class has gotten better and better and better and better and better. Here's why, because I keep learning one subject this is all about the heart. The reason people don't serve God, the reason people don't love God, the people reason don't go to church, the people reason don't do the things they should be doing, it's all about the heart. And you know, when you work on them to get them to do it and they don't do it, guess what? It's because of a bad heart. Is anybody listening? And he comes along, he calls them a hip, uh, hypocrites because they look good on the outside, they sound good, and you and I can do that too, but on the inside. And one of the prayers, each one of us say, God, here's my heart, I want you to develop it. And when you pray that prayer, I want you to know something. That is not something you just throw out at God. That's a real changing time. And that's not the easiest prayer to re request God for because he's gonna start changing your heart and he's gonna change it through probably a lot of hardship. Don't run from him. Realize he's changing your heart. Is anybody listening? Come on. <clears throat> Very important for us to see that. And he comes along and he says these words. And in vain they worship me. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but in vain is, if you have that in your Bible, you've got your Bible open, you ought to circle the words in vain. In vain <clears throat> means this. Worthless no good, unreceived, and no value. In other words, if I'm a hypocrite because I'm not doing what God would have me to do and I don't wanna do it, but I, maybe not, I'm not doing what God would have me to do because I just don't know how to do it. There's a big difference between I don't wanna do it and I don't know how to do it. If I say to God, God, I don't know how to stop this sinful thing that I'm practicing, I just don't know how, will you help me? That's a big difference than someone that says, I'm not gonna stop this sinful thing. Do you see? Because God gets into the one that wants to change the heart and deals with the heart. But if you put up a wall and say, this is the way I am, too bad, take me the way I am, guess what? He'll take you the way you are, but he wants to change you. If you won't let him change you, it's your call. It's your life to live. So in vain they worship. Did they sing? Did they do what? They probably did what we did. Worship is the, I, I, here's what I believe with all of my heart, and I don't know if you wanna get this or not. Worship, the lowest form, and I hate to use the word lowest, but the least probably acceptable form of worship is singing a song to God led by an organization. Because it's all you have to do, and you know this, you can be brain dead and sing the words on the screen and it never comes from your heart. Is that not true? 
Haven't we all been there? Haven't you? Haven't we, over the years, 30 years of, of, of pastor in this church, I've run up how many times and said, okay, you're all finished. You're not worshiping God. Get out. You know, and everybody goes, oh. You know, here's why. Because you know, it's in vain. And this was in vain. They worshiped me. I don't ever want to worship God in vain. So you might say to me, pastor, how do I really worship God? You worship God with your life style of living. When I live out what God would have for me, God's will, God's way, even though I don't want to do it, that's worship. The first time, remember, I'll remind you, the first time Abraham ever, the word worship was used in the Bible, and it's a law of first use in scripture as you're studying scripture, the law of first use is usually the right First time it's ever expressed in the Bible is usually the right way it's expressed in the Bible. So first time the word worship's ever used is when Abraham, he wasn't singing, had no drums, he wasn't playing a horn, a clarinet, wasn't playing a drum, he wasn't doing any of that stuff. He had a knife and he was ready to plunge it into his son as a sacrifice, Isaac. And God put away his hands and said, put that away, now I know. And he said, called him, and the first time the word worship ever used, and he worshiped God, why? His lifestyle, his actions, his following the will and way of God was the worship God's looking for from every one of us. Now, when we come in his house, why we sing, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that it gets the world off of you. It gets you back on thinking about God. It gets you back tenderhearted and and get you ready to prepare to receive the word of God. And it kind of prepares you for what you're getting right now. That's, that's that purpose of worship. But if you think that's the only kind of worship God's looking for, he does, let me ask you a question. Does he need worship? Is he some egotistical being in the sky? Some floating around on a cosmic cloud that needs humanity to worship him because of his ego. You gotta be kidding me, man. He had a billion, trillion angels worshiping him if you wanted that. What he's looking for is somebody with a free will heart that says, I'm going to, even though I don't want to do it, I'm gonna do it anyway because that's what you want for me. Now that becomes worship. Is anybody listening? So the word vain, it really is amazing. So they worship me in vain, and how do they do it? Teaching the commandments of men which we do constantly in churches across America. We teach the commandments of men. I remember one time a guy asked me, it was one of the largest conferences in the world, and I was asked to be the speaker in a different country. And I said, man, I just wanted that so bad. I was a young guy, you know, and a large, I mean, 30,000, 40,000 people in attendance, you know, your microphone and goes boom, 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 boom through the auditorium, you know, and you know, I mean, you're just get to minister. This is a highlight of every preacher's life. And I said to the guy, I said, let me tell you, I would love to do it, I want to do it, but I'm gonna tell you something. God told me anytime that I have a crowd in front of me to give an altar call, which I've done faithfully all of these years, and I could be in the strangest place giving altar calls and have people get saved, you know? And uh, so it just was God. And I said, so I, if I'm in front of all those people, I'm gonna give them an altar call. He said, oh no, we don't do that. And if you have to come and give an altar call, we don't believe in that. We don't want you to do it, don't come. I was broken hearted, because I really wanted to go. But guess what? Today, they give an altar call, because they learned how to give an altar call. Some weird guy in California taught him eventually. But guess what? They learn how to give an all call. And my point being is this. My point being is this. Is that we can hook on to the commandment. Put my verse back up there. But we can hook on to the commandments of men and never fulfill the plan of God. And that's what he's saying right there. Go on to the next verse, verse number 10. And when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. Now stop right there. Hear and understand, there are three things God wants you to do 
with the word of God. Here are the three things. How simple could there be? Finally, somebody's gonna tell you what the three things are that God wants you to do with the word of the Lord. You wanna know what they are? Number one, you need to hear it. But hearing it isn't good enough. You need to understand it. Number two, does anybody know what number three could possibly be? You need to what? Do it. You'll never do it if you don't understand it. You'll never understand it if you don't hear it. And so when he makes a statement like that, all of a sudden, wow, it jumps off the page and gives you insight on what God wants for you in your future. He wants you to hear, he wants you to understand, and he wants you to eventually do that brings the blessings of God to your life. Come on, somebody. And without that understanding, we go to church wondering, I wonder what God wants for me. I hope the preacher's good. I hope he can make me laugh. I hope he, my mother used to say, you know, people love it when you're short. You need to preach short messages. I shut up, mom. I don't want to preach. You're 96 years old. I'm telling her, stop. I don't preach short messages. I preach godly messages. It takes a long time too bad. That's one of those things. I'm going to worship God even though I don't feel like it. And I'm going to listen. I'm going to understand. And guess what? I'm going to do Verse number, five, verse number 11 comes along. It's kind of interesting. He says, not what goes into a man mouth, it goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. <laughs> Isn't that exactly what you saw from verse one? It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles, you better not do that. It's what comes out of a man's mouth that defiles a man. I don't know, verse number 12, let me see if, if I remember 12. It says this, oh no, let's go back to 11, I'll get there at 12 in a minute. Now listen to what I'm gonna say to you, with keeping this in mind. Your mind and your thoughts determine your future. Most people's point of success, wait a minute, let me, let me say it again. Most people, got it? Point of success is when they have accumulated more material things than their own mother and father. And they stop and are satisfied because what they're thinking is is now I have arrived where I'm comfortable. The problem with it is this, you have the wrong father image you are following. Is anybody listening? And when you have the wrong following of the father image, you will stop anywhere instead of continuing forward doing what it is that God has you to do. So your mind, some of you get up every day and you fight with God about where you're at, what you're doing. You're insecure, full of fear. You, you can't see yourself ever going past that. Enough, you say, is enough. There's no need to have any more. I don't, let me tell you something. With God, there is no limits. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. In other words, to what degree do you believe? And so, listen to this. It's not what goes in the mouth, it's what comes out of the mouth. And where does it come from? The heart. You're gonna see that in a moment. So what's in the heart speaks and it defiles your future. And so, what you need to do is start speaking what you wanna see in your future. It'll develop the heart and develop your thinking. Is anybody listening? Okay, let's just move on. His disciples come to him. I love these disciples. They're really cool guys. They come to Jesus in verse number 12. The disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when, you heard, when they heard this saying? Like, hello, you're the creator of the heavens and earth, know everything, just read their mail, and you don't think I know that they're offended? Sometimes we care too much about offending people. And we end up offending God because we're more afraid of people than God. Is anybody listening? 
And so this is not about just, and I wanna love people. I wanna get along with people. I wanna encourage people. I wanna develop people. I wanna see the best of people. The Bible tells us that love does that. And I agree with all of that, but guess what? I'm not gonna offend God because I'm afraid of man. I'm gonna say it like it is. I mean, I used to preach and people would get up and walk out, you know, and I'd say, go on, get out. Everybody go, just keep on going. You don't want to hear the word of God anyway. And they go, hey, I just, as they walked out, you know, I thought I was a heretic. I probably was in those days. But I was absolutely wild for the word of God. You understand? I was wild for God. And I wasn't going to say it, candy coat it, get the traditions of men, say it so I cannot offend anybody. I will offend you. I will get in your face. That's probably why I don't have very many friends. Because you want compromise. I'm in your face about it. And if you think I'm in your face, you ought to be married to Isaiah, the prophet's sister. She is going to really be in your face. (laughs) See, that's what I'm saying is that sometimes we need to say it like it is. They are offended and they heard this. And you know what Jesus says? Who cares? Watch the next verse, verse 13. But he answered and said, every plant which is not my heavenly father. Oh, God. Make this real to us. He just said, these people are such losers in their ecclesiastical religious attitudes, they don't even belong to God. They're going to die and go to hell and he knows it. Do you understand that? And he uses this as every plant on which my father has not planted will be uprooted. He just made a statement about these Pharisees and scribes. He can do that. I can't, neither can you. Because he's the judge, I'm not. But he just made a statement about these Pharisees and judges. Even though they knew the scripture, quoted the scripture, debated the scripture, sang the scripture, did all the stuff, the traditions of men, they're gonna die and go to hell. In other words, they're going to inevitably fail before you. Sometimes we beat up things. We fight with people, argue with people because they don't think like we think or see things like we think. You know, just love them. Don't even care. If they're not gonna make it, that's God's business. If they're making it, it's God's business. But watch the next verse. Verse number 14. Let them alone. In other words, leave them alone. They're not gonna make it anyway unless they change and get their heart right which is so bizarre. I gotta hurry because I got some things I wanna say to you tonight that are really important. He says, they are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both might, both could. No, wait a minute. You don't think, wait a minute, maybe he doesn't wanna offend anybody. Maybe he wants to be, you know, let's talk about Jesus' expression here. He says, you know, maybe they're, they're blind leaders of the blind and the blind leads the blind both you know, could, you know, possibly, they will. The inevitability of those that don't serve God will be in a ditch, period. You may not see it immediately. You may not see it in five years. You may not see it in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years but they will be in a ditch. So just leave it alone. Leave them alone. They got problems. They are lost because of their hearts. Verse 15. And Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. I mean, it couldn't have been any clearer. Hello, Peter. Let's get it together here, you know what I mean? We got it. You need to get it together. Peter's a cock up, isn't he? Explain this to us, because there might be something I missed here because you said a whole lot of things. What do you say? Verse number 16, thank God Jesus is so good. He says, are you also still without understanding? Like, Peter, can I translate that in modern day San Bernardino language? Peter, are you really stupid? I mean, like, dumb. I already explained it to you, Peter. And you're still without understanding? Watch this, verse number 17. Verse number 17, do you not yet understand that whoever enters, whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? 
do I have to explain that to anybody in here? Because if I have to explain that to anybody in here, you need to go see a doctor. Verse, <laughs> verse 18. I'm not going to even talk about that. Verse 17. I'm not explaining that to you. Okay, verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart, and they defile a man. How much negativity comes out of your heart? How much complaining comes out of our hearts? How much questioning God who is in control comes out of our hearts? How much discouragement do we spread to our own souls by what comes out of our hearts? Wow, I'll I'll talk more about this as we go, but let me just finish this verse for for a second. Verse number 19, please. Thank you, guys are doing so great back there. Thank you. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murder, adulterous fornication, thefts, and and false witnesses, and blasphemies. He's just telling you this, that out of the heart proceeds evil. What? Thoughts. Now watch this. See the word evil up there? It's not just those things that he named. It's anything contrary to the will and way of God, which a lot of people don't understand the definition of evil. Evil is anything contrary to the will and the way of God. So it could fit into society. It could fit into the social thinking. It could fit into the so-called moral majority decision-making process of traditions and human values. But it could be wrong with God. The Supreme Court can come along and say, this is a new law in our land. And it may be right with them, but it's wrong with God. And anything that's thought of as evil is contrary to the ways of God. Just that simple. Let me say it again. Anything that's evil is contrary to the ways of God. So here he comes out, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. In other words, when thoughts rise up that are contrary to the ways of God, you have to do something about it and stop them. And I'll show you how in a minute. In verse number 20, last verse. And it says, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. It's not what he does on the outside. Things that defile a man is what comes out of his heart that he speaks from his mouth that started with his thoughts that were contrary to the ways of God. So my deal is to get my thoughts to the place where they line up with God so that out of my heart I speak what God says and what God wants and what God's plan and what God's will and way is and therefore I am not operating in evil, I'm operating in my salvation rights. Now listen closely. So important for us to see this because I want to take you real quick and then I'm going to close. In Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 45. Just pop this up. A good man, that's a good man. How many know there's none good but God? So when you read the word good in the Bible, it's not talking about good according to your thinking or social status or social ideas. A good man is somebody who's a godly man. Okay? We shouldn't part, I don't want to go into the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You got it from the tree of knowledge of good. Now you can determine for yourself what is good. That's not good. God is what's good. None good but God, Jesus says. Okay. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth godly will, ways, wants. An evil man, contrary, in other words, a man that's contrary to the ways of God, out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth things that are contrary to the will's ways of God. The whole thing is about the heart and what you allow your heart to bring forth out of your mouth. Is anybody listening? For out of the abundance of the heart, for out of the, now remember the very first statement they made to Jesus was an abrasive accusation, accusing him and trying to exalt themselves in the face of people in Jesus, because they were the hot shots from Jerusalem. And the first thing out of their mouth 
was this, the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Jesus is confronted by Pontius Pilate and he's speaking to him and is looking down his nose and making comments to him. And one thing Jesus does is he's silent. The reason he's silent because he already knew where it's in this guy's heart. Is anybody listening? In order for you and I to be wise in the future, we need to know what's in the person's heart we're dealing with. And usually the first words come out of their mouth. Watch James for a second. In James, the third chapter, starting verse number eight, <clears throat> we'll go through verse number 12 real quick, we'll close. No man can tame the tongue, what comes out of the heart. When I first read that, I said, gee, I mean, I'm just a young Christian. I said, God, no man can tame the tongue, so therefore it's settled. I, I can't stop talking, thinking, speaking evil. I can't, no man can tame the tongue. God says, what's it say? I said, it says, no man can tame the tongue. He says, read it again. No man can tame the tongue. God, I, it says, no man can tame the tongue. And God spoke to me as clear as a bell. No man can tame the tongue. I said, yeah, that's what I said. It's what it says. He says, I don't want the man to train, tame the tongue. It's the Holy Spirit that's on the inside of you that tames the tongue. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than your tongue if you'll let the Holy Spirit get involved in what it is you're gonna open your mouth about. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That's what he's talking about, stuff spilling out of our mouth. You can't change that on your own power. You need God. Now watch this, verse number nine. With it, speaking of the tongue, we bless God, our Father, and with it we curse men. We have been made, who have been made in the similitude of God, verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings, my brethren. These things ought not to be so. Verse number 11. Does the spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? In other words, these were men of God, supposedly, that came to Jesus that were scribes and Pharisees, and from their mouth were things contrary to the plan of God and the will and the way of God, and Jesus picked up on it immediately. He says, verse number 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs, thus no spring yields both salt water fresh. We're made by God from our mouth to speak what God says, not what we think, not what we feel, not what society says, not what your checkbook speaks, not what your boss says, not what the politicians who have never kept their word to us ever, any one of them, say, because we're not under that, we're under him. And we need to speak what he says, because anything contrary to that is evil and will pollute your life. If God spoke to you tonight, give him a great big praise the Lord. Now, sorry, that's what happens when I only teach once a month and it's my own fault because my wonderful sons ask me all the time and I just don't want to. Because I am retired. Okay, here's the deal. Anybody in here want to stop messing around with God Get saved tonight and know you're going to heaven and not going to hell. Now, wait a minute. Some of you in here are going to walk out of here, live your stupid lives, and you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. That's right. Some of you in here right now, tonight in this place, are going to walk out of this place, live your life out, not godly, but live it out your way, not even learning what God says, and you're gonna die and go to hell. And tonight you can change that. Jesus said you must be born again. That means tonight by giving God all of your heart, this is what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means you've given God all of your heart, given God all of your life. You say, well, wait a minute, pastor, you don't understand. I've been going to church since I was a child. 
Yeah, could you show me that in the Bible that will get you to heaven? That's the traditions of men. Wait a minute, my mom and dad had me christen or baptize or took me to Sabbath school when I was a kid all my life. Guess what? Tradition of men. It's not in the Bible. That won't get you to heaven. I was told that if I didn't belong to a certain denomination as a child, I would die and go to hell. That's a lie. That's a tradition, false teaching of men. Because that's not how you get to heaven. You get to heaven by being born again John 3rd chapter, and giving God. Now watch what you gotta give him. He's doing, he did it to you, he gave you everything. You gotta give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. That's being born again, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Without that, you are not saved. You don't get saved because you're cute. You don't get saved because you're smart. You don't get saved because you're educated. You don't get saved because you didn't rob the local 7-Eleven store since you were 12 years old. You don't get saved because you're a nice person, a friendly person, and you gave gifts to the poor, and the guy at the corner stop sign, you gave 20 bucks because it's Christmas and it was raining out, and you know, you felt bad because he was standing out on the street. You don't get to heaven that way. You get saved, it's a heart thing. You gotta give him all of your heart, and you gotta give him all of your life. Now, wait a minute. I'll prove it to you. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. Last book in the Bible, you've heard of it. It's the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation says this. Listen to this. I love this. Jesus is coming again, and he says these words. I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you from my mouth. Now, who in the heck is he talking about? Lukewarm. What's lukewarm? It's somebody who thinks they're a Christian that are half in, half out, little up, little down, token prayer, not against God, but not wholehearted for God. Let me say that last one again. It's not against God, but not wholehearted for God. One more time. It's not against God, but not wholehearted for God. So you gotta give him all of your heart you got to give him all of your life. It's a choice you make, not a choice he made. He made his choice to go to the cross for you so you could. Now it's your choice of whether or not you'll receive him by giving him all of your heart and all of your life. And here we are in this safe, friendly place. And tonight, you've been great listening to the word of God. Listen to Grandpa for a second. I'm telling you the truth. If you don't get saved tonight, some of you are going to live out your life, die, and go to hell. And you do not want that. Believe me, you don't want it. And you need to stop messing with God because somebody's fighting for your soul right now. Some preacher one time said, why do you do that? You just coerce people to come to Jesus. Yeah, well, when the devil stops coercing you to get away from Jesus, I'll stop coercing you to get to Jesus. I'm in a battle for your soul right now. That's why I'm in your face. Thank God somebody will tell you the truth. And you need to get up and you need to come forward. And can I tell you something? I don't have a lot of time tonight, but I hope you guys will let me do this. There's 12 of you that need to get up and come. Who will be the first? Stand up, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, whatever it is. Bring a friend if you need a friend. Tap your friend on the shoulder and say, come on, I'll go with you. Get out of your seat and meet me right here in front. No head down, no body, no body, no nothing. Everybody just stay seated. Joel, just stay seated. Twelve of you need to come. Now, whether none of you come, that's your business. I did my job and told you the truth. Now, whether you respond, it's like I preach the word of God to you. Not everybody's going to respond to it. You can walk out here and say, man, I really got something out of that. But it doesn't mean you're going to hear, understand, and do. Who's first? How do I know there's 12? Because God said there's 12. Doesn't mean you're gonna all come. Who's first? Get your stuff and come on and stop messing with God. You know you need to come, come. There's 11. There's 10 more. There's nine more, there's eight more, there's seven more, there's six more, there's five more. 
This is a move of the Holy Spirit. Nobody comes to God but by the Holy Spirit. I don't have to do anything. It's just the Holy Spirit. There's five more. There's four more. You know you need to. This is, you don't miss this. Both of you? Both of you? Yeah, she's okay. All right, there's four more. There's three more. Three more. Thank you, Larry. Larry's my friend. He's already saved. Three more. I'm not looking at anybody. But boy, are you making a wrong choice. Letting the devil talk you out of what you know you need to do. <laughs> it's going to be that way for the rest of your existence if you let him talk you out of it. When you know you need to come, there's three more of you. There's three more of you. Here's another one. There's two more of you. Just two more. I'm stopping after that. If there is more than that and you know it was you, you missed it. Because there's always more than what God says. Is that both of you? Both of you? Yes? Come on. I think that's 12. Thank God you guys have come, Pastor Joel. This, this is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to take you right over to this side over here, and he's going to beat the snot out of you for a while, and then I'm only playing with you. Listen, he's going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then he's going to give you some free stuff about what to do next. It is really cool. We want to be your church. If you don't already have a church, trust me, you will get the word of God here and you will be loved in this place. That's, that's all we can promise you. We promise to love you. That's the coolest thing about the Rock Church. We're in your face, but we love you. So Pastor Joel, if you guys, if people you came with will wait for you, only take a few moments. Make a left turn and follow him right over there. Is that all right? And he'll pray with you. Thanks, Daphne. Come on, everybody, give the Lord a great big praise.